HDR stands for high dynamic range, and I typically take an HDR picture in a place where it has really high contrast. So here's an example of that inside a church where when I would normally take a picture, I would either be able to see the detailing in these windows here and everything else would be black, or I'd be able to see the detailing in the stone and the wind stained glass windows here would be blown out and would look white. So what you do is you take three photos uh, at different um, EV settings or exposures so that you can blend them into a high dynamic range photo. Here's another example. This is a nice sunny day so you don't blow out the blue sky and, and the clouds. You still get all the detailing in the hills there. So the first thing I'm going to do is show you how you can turn bracketing on in on your camera so that you can take three photos consecutively um, overexposing, underexposing, and taking a regular exposure. Then I'll show you how to combine them in Photoshop. I stole the footage for this out of another YouTube video, but basically you can see how the person is setting up bracketing in their D90 camera. It's probably similar in other Nikons. So they went to bracketing, they're going down to bracketing order, and here you set it to do, um, I believe, under regular and then over exposure. Um, yeah. There you go. The next thing he's going to show us how to do is find the bracketing button on the outside of your camera. Basically, you hold that down, and on the D90, you have two wheels or two dials that you can dial around. You want to set it to take three consecutive frames at two stops over and under. And basically, you hold down your shutter, and you have it on high or low speed shooting, and it goes boom, 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 takes three pictures, just like he's showing in the example. You'll want to shoot in aperture priority mode or manual mode so that your aperture doesn't change while you're shooting. You'll also want to use a low ISO like ISO 100 for better results and shoot with a tripod. It's recommended. So you've already taken your three uh, pictures and with your camera. I'm going to show you now how you can merge them using Photoshop and then create an HDR high dynamic range photo. So you've already taken your photos. The first thing you want to do in Photoshop is go to File and automate and merge to HDR Pro. It's going to bring up this box and basically you want to browse to find your photos. Go into wherever you keep them and you can highlight all three by clicking the first, holding down shift and clicking the last and then saying open. You'll see them all listed here and then just say OK. What it's going to do as well is attempt to automatically align each picture just in case you moved while you were taking them. This part takes a while. Okay, so it's finished the first step, and what it's showing us here is uh, that it can see which image was overexposed, which was the regular exposure, and which was underexposed. And uh, up here, it sometimes has the 16-bit option chosen, where you can do a lot of the HDR work with Photoshop. However, I'm going to show you how to do it with Photomatics plugin, which I think does a better job. So I'm going to go to 32 bit, which uh, allows us to work with as much information as possible to make the best photo possible. So I'm going to say OK. And again, this is going to take a little while. Your next step, once it's done merging, is Photoshop has done a little bit of processing. And if I bring up my history window here, you can see it has this 32-bit preview option thing, and everything I've learned says that if you're going to use Photomatics, you want to step backwards and undo that step. So if you just click your history uh, window, and you can go up, up to the previous step, and it changes back to before Photoshop did something. If you can't find your history window, you can just do edit step backwards. Okay, so now we're ready for Photomatics. If you go up to Filter, you can go down to Photomatics and Tone Mapping. And it brings up this window. This is where we get to do all the tweaks to make it look cool. And you can see uh, whatever I did last time seems to look pretty cool already on this photo. So um, let's go through each slider and see what they do. So the first slider here changes the strength of the HDR. Basically, I think how much contrast it pulls out from the three pictures. If I turn it all the way down, you can see quickly the difference in the picture there. There it looks very dark. I turn that up. 
let's try 50. And if I crank it all the way up to 100, you can again see the difference. The closer you get to 100, the more surreal it looks, I'd say. And, uh, you know, it looks a little more photorealistic around 50. I'm going to say I kind of like the surreal look of it in this particular photo, so I'm going to keep that around 90. The next is the color saturation. Again, if I crank that all the way to zero, you can see it almost looks black and white. And if I crank it to 100, everything is really uh, colorful and, again, it's going to be a little more photorealistic at about the midway point. Again, I'm going for something a little more surreal in this picture, a little more cartoony, so I'll keep that quite high. Okay, the next setting is luminosity, and basically that means how bright it is. Let's turn this down to minus 10. You can see it's very dark. If I crank that up to 10, basically it's pulling out all of the information it can from the shadows. So again, I don't think that 10 looks awesome in this particular case. Uh, let's turn it down, and uh, we want to keep some of the darks dark, but pull some of the information out. So I'm going to keep that. The micro contrast slider changes how much detail it pulls out of shadows and bright areas. So let's crank it to 10. You can see it's uh, very dark. All the way to the left, it's really light. Um, again, depends how much information you want to pull out of those shadows. And I don't know. As, as I'm lightening it up, I can see more and more of the detail on the tread here. The next thing is smoothing. I find that maximum makes it look more like a cartoon, and minimum makes it look, sorry, I meant to say the opposite. So the more on minimized the smoothing is, the stranger it looks. It almost looks to me like it's wrapped in cellophane. And you can see as we just progress up here, the farther right, the more photorealistic it typically looks. So uh, that looks the most realistic, the more most true to what your eye would have seen. Although I think in this case, high looks, for me, the best. That's what I would like. I find everything else beyond this point uh, is just playing around with sliders similar to what you might do in Photoshop. Um, you can define a white point. Again, let's crank it one way so you can see that's blowing out some of the information in the white. If I crank it all the way down, it's too dark. So I think around here looks pretty good. Uh, again, black points defining where the information, uh, how much information is in your black. And I've heard most people say you shouldn't set the black point to zero. Gamma is um, basically how bright it is. Uh, it's a little different from luminosity and in fact if you've darkened your image using luminosity you can use gamma to pull out more of that information again. I won't say that they're exactly the same but there are some similarities. You can change color settings in here. Temperature, making it warmer or cooler depending on what you're going for. I typically try and do a lot of this stuff in Photoshop. So here's saturation of just the highlights. So if we want the lighter areas to be less saturated and the darker areas to be more saturated, we can change that. You can see uh, how the light areas have almost become black and white, making the car maybe stand out more. That's kind of neat. But you can crank that up, and you see the opposite effect. Here again, we can desaturate the darker areas or saturate them a lot. Micro-smoothing um, smooths out... Uh, graininess. So again, we can crank this around just to see how it affects things. You can see some of the detailing is gone from the car because of that. And when I turn it back down, uh, you can see a lot of the detailing and the dirtiness almost of, of the paint job on this car has come back out. Uh, you can smooth highlights. You can smooth shadows. And shadow clipping. So basically that's the cutoff point for what information will be shown in the darker areas. So as you can see when I crank that up it clips out a lot of the information from the dark area. And that is it. Click OK and then it'll take you back to Photoshop and you can see the finished results.